the dark is dropping like a spot A black ink squeezed into a glass of water And now the crowds are thinning out Into the light down in the subway station And we're off. Welcome to the Toga Sports Podcast. This is co-host Chris Maley and I'm joined by David Johnson. Toga Sports Podcast. T-S-P. <laughs> we finally found a name. It's also the name for a teaspoon, so I think, I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but that's a... What is teaspoon at? T-S-P. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> Alright, well we, that's not sports related, but that's the acronym <laughs> for our podcast now. <laughs> but anyways, we're gonna, today we're gonna talk about Shen Football, who competed in the state quarterfinals this past Saturday and Shen Soccer, who competed in the state semifinals. And then we'll get to some NFL uh, fantasy football and college basketball stuff, things of that nature. Sounds good. But um, I went to Shen Football at Deep Stadium in Kingston this past Saturday, and Shen knocked off John J. East Fishkill 27-20. to um, I was really impressed. It was only the second time I've been able to see them in person, the other time being against Saratoga in Week 3, I believe, or earlier this year, but... Shen really, I mean, they are the real deal. There's no question about it. They're, they're the best high school football team I've seen with my own eyes probably since I've been on earth. I mean, they have so <laughs> many seniors. There's, it's just hard to explain like how talented and deep they are. Um, defensively, they were so outstanding. It was basically the story of the night. They held the Patriots to essentially 65 yards the whole game until the final six minutes when John Jay put together two long scoring drives in garbage time. And eventually uh, they kicked an onside kick with a minute left, down by seven, but it went out of bounds. And then Shen came out in victory formation, and it was over. But, you know, the seven-point win, it, you know, the scoreboard didn't really tell the whole story. It was basically they jumped out to a 27-7 lead um, in the third quarter, and the defense was so dominant that the offense, I'm pretty sure the offense got 14 or 15 yards in the second half. Because Clawson, they were just like, all right, we're just going to run it, take safe passes, and Clawson's all right. Clawson's like, we're just going to punt it. And by Clawson, I mean head coach Brian Clawson. Because our defense is playing so well, as a coach, why wouldn't you just punt it, you know? Yeah. So I was really impressed. You know, the defensive line of Cromer, uh, Jaluli, um, Matt Dillon, and the other guy, I forget, the nose guard, they were just... They were just blowing off blocks. I mean, just getting penetration in the backfield at will. You know, their quarterback, John Jay, uh, Ryan Schumacher, he's been known to scramble and get outside the pocket and use his legs. But he really had almost zero opportunities to do that. He did scramble for maybe one or two first downs, but he was held in check the entire night, as well as their other, their entire offense was held in check. And, um,. Yeah, so they clinched their first semifinal burst since 2011, and they're going to face... Who do they face this weekend, Dave? Newburgh Free Academy. Newburgh Free Academy, who is the Section 9 champion, I believe. Yeah. Um, so that'll be an even bigger test for sure. Newburgh is coming off a bye. Of course, the byes are randomized as far as when it comes to the Section 2 Class A playoffs, or all the playoffs, I believe. Right? They, they, yeah, they, they beat uh, Monroe Woodbury in the sectional final okay. uh, from Section 9. Uh, Monroe Woodbury won it, won that game last year, and they, I think they made a run to the playoffs. But but anyways, Newburgh, three years ago, made it to the state championship. And I, um, but from what I heard, I was talking to some people down at the at Kingston, talking about New, what their thoughts were on Newburgh, and they're saying this year's team is not as good as the one three years ago. So Shen might be the slight favorite, you know, favorite underdog. Who knows at this point? Every team is obviously legit. But, I mean, if the thing about Shen is if they limit the turnovers, um, personnel-wise, it's really, there's not a lot of scenarios in which you can physically match up, go toe-to-toe, and, and beat these guys, unless you're going to force them into mistakes. You know, Shen did have a lot of mistakes in the first quarter. It was a scoreless first quarter. Shen had at least three three penalties, it was very uncommon of them, actually. They just came out really slow. Then in the second quarter, uh, Van Galen started to hit his go-to receiver, Jordan Zlogar, and they, he caught all six of, his, six of his seven passes in the second quarter, I believe. 
Um, and Zlogar obviously broke the Section 2 single-season record for receiving yards. He now has 1,168, so congrats to him. Obviously, an amazing receiver, just physically gifted. He made a couple of tremendous plays in the game. One of his touchdowns was just a jump ball with a defender that he just somehow came down with. I have no idea how. Is there any way for other teams to slow him down, or is there? are they just finding ways to get him open, or is he just too much of a physical presence for other teams to contain? I mean, or do you think people can game plan to stop him? I don't... That's really tough. I think um, he might... He might be too good, man, because, you know, he was beating double coverage. There was one play where he beat, uh, it was a 40-yard bomb. Van Galen underthrew it, like, kind of slightly, because he was streaking with two defenders near him, and Zlogar, you know, their chemistry is so good, he, like, came back to it and caught it in double coverage. Um, I don't know. Their chemistry is so good where, I don't know. Maybe the fact that they have so many other weapons that you have to key on, like their big tight end and Cromer, mm-hmm. they have the two running backs with Taft and Robinson, who can dice you up in the backfield, and then their third running back, Brendan Mara, they barely even used in the quarterfinals, and he is such a versatile threat, catching, throwing. I mean, he's yeah, he threw for a touchdown pass earlier this year, and he can <laughs> run it. But I think the fact that they have so many other weapons has to help his cause, but... I just think the connection between Van Galen and Zlogar is too good for teams to stop, as far as I think. But well, So far, we haven't seen it. So. Yeah, no one's been able to stop him. I mean, that obviously, going into the week, that was probably uh, John Jay's first emphasis, let's stop Jordan Zlogar, mm-hmm. because in the previous two games, John Jay allowed a lot of passing yards. Um, even though they won, they allowed an uncharacteristic amount of yards, so you knew Shen was going to try to test their secondary, and they did, and they did it successfully, so... <laughs> Uh, we'll see. It, the Newburg game should be interesting. I mean, as long as Shen limits its mistakes, I think they have a good chance to win again. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, let's o- switch over real quick to the game I saw on Saturday. It was the Shen boys soccer team in the state semifinals, back in the state semifinals. And they really played well in an overtime loss. Um, they, I mean, they've been known you know, historically to just possess the ball in midfield, you know, be strong in defense, you know, create chances just by keeping the ball, not giving the ball away, any, you know, no cheap passes, yeah. uh, not letting the other team really touch it, and just putting the pressure on and wearing the other team down. Well, at the same time, uh, Comac, that was their game plan, is to let Shen have the possession and just try and counterattack, or at least that's what uh, Comac's head coach, uh, David Viegas, said. And... Really, they just held on, defended well. They were very organized in defense, and 80 minutes went by, no score for either team, so it went to overtime. Uh, during regulation, Shen passed the the 400 minute mark of not the last time they allowed a goal was in the regular season against Shaker in uh, one of their th- three losses. So 400 straight minutes of uh, goalless soccer, and eventually. Comac did score in the first overtime period on uh, it's kind of a just a scrum in the box on a long throw in. They've got a couple kids who can just chuck the ball in from the sidelines right into the the middle of the goal box, and this one happened to bounce to the far post. And Anthony Izzo, who had just subbed on, uh, was there to just tap it into an open goal early, and uh, that's how the game went. It was a uh, I mean a, a great season for Shen. They had huge contributions from all their seniors all over the pitch. Uh, even their juniors, uh, their goalkeeper, Jerry Lewandowski, he played great all game, made a nice save when they needed him to. And uh, they had chances, they just, you know, they couldn't score. Uh, Coach John Bain thought that, uh, you know, in past games they just wore teams down and they scored late in the game, in the the regional game, uh, the week before. Uh, in the, even the section final, against uh, Niskayuna. They scored late in the game in that one. So it's it looked like a repeat of one of those performances. They they were never really in danger of giving up a goal, but they eventually did in overtime uh, just because they couldn't get one themselves before that. Uh, really nice performance by uh, Tucker Marvin right in front of the the defense. He was a beast. He had to, uh, he had to try and contain uh, Comac's best player, Justin salad baller uh, he, they moved him sort of all over the field to try and get uh, Comac did to get him 
more touches and open space. But it seemed like every time he went to make a play, uh, Marvin was there to tackle him or shield him off the ball or just disrupt things. So, um, yeah, it was a good a good season for them. Uh, they probably would have liked to be playing on Sunday for the championship, but um, and they probably would have had a chance against Fairport from Section Five. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, that's that's how some things go sometimes in overtimes. You know, one bounce of the ball in soccer, and yeah, you know. Uh, sometimes the the team that doesn't dictate the play can sometimes steal a game, and uh, you see that sometimes a U.S. soccer team does that to <laughs> to, to uh, opponents that are much better than them. They can somehow steal the game. So, well, what was sort of the level of disappointment from Bain and his players after the game? You know, with so many seniors on their team, they kind of this was kind of their their chance this year. You know, do you feel like? Yeah. They, they well, really, to... I mean, because the team hadn't won. This this group of players hadn't won sectionals yet, so really that was they really needed to win sectionals to sort of validate you know to because they they were the best team and so they all the pressure on them was to win sectionals this year with this group and they did do that uh, they beat an undefeated team in the regional round and then just I don't know they just uh, so they had a really play. successful season and it just a yeah bad bounce of the ball yeah. I mean, that's sort of what it came down to. It wasn't that simple, obviously, but they yeah. they probably had... There was no, like, 100% clear-cut opportunity for them to score, but they did have, like, ha- a bunch of half chances where, you know, a player steps on the ball instead of pushes it in front of them, or, you know, header across the box is, like, just missed by someone on the far post trying to score. So, um, I mean, obviously they're disappointed because they lost, and they probably would have had a chance at the state title. Um if things had gone a little differently, but uh, they got to be, you know, proud of their performance. You know, they played the same way they did all year, so you know, you can't ask them to play different once it gets to the state level. Yeah. So. No, once you get to states, you know, <laughs> every team is so good that. Yeah, and um, it's not to say the Comac was bad either. That you know, they their strategy was to let Shen have possession and to try and score on the counter. I saw your picture, by the way. Of the their team, does Comac have like more people than Shen do at their school? Because I don't know if is that even possible. The, <laughs> I I I doubt they have more people in the school, but uh, the coach said they go about twenty deep. Uh, I don't think they went that. How many deep. kids were like there was basically like, there on their team? There was thirty three players on the roster, and then 33? I think three. I think they had a couple uh, ball boys line up with them too. <laughs> So who doesn't thirty three seem unnecessary or no? I feel like that's, that's I would three I'd rather <laughs> Yeah. Like if I was a bench player, I'd rather just sit home and like not go. I don't know. <laughs> Is it a sort of a slap of face? Yeah. You're like third string. I don't know. We could make yeah. a completely third team out of our team that's how you, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it was funny to to look just at the <laughs> at the opening uh the opening player announcements just because they had so many players, but uh, he, he, did, he did use a lot of subs, and it was someone who had just got a rest and was just subbed into the game who scored the the match winner. So maybe uh, the coach. Uh, yeah, coach I wonder how many uh, are in their graduating class or in their total school as well. We'll yeah. have to find that out. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> that's that's that. All right, so we'll shift gears to professional sports now, and. The NFL occurred this Sunday, as it does every Sunday. And what were kind of your main thoughts from uh, this past weekend, Dave, on the NFL? Um, I know actually, the Bill, your Bills played last Thursday, so you didn't get to see the Bills. Yeah, I saw the Bills. Not on Sunday, you didn't. Uh, not on Sunday. Sam. Yeah. Well, uh, they're you know the memory of the Dolphins just running into the backfield and crushing Orin every time. <laughs> well, that that will be in my mind for every day for the next week or so. But. Uh, <laughs> Um, I actually got a theory uh, during the Bills game. You want to hear my theory? Okay. Um, as Orton was just being continually knocked to the ground, and uh, on the final series, Bills obviously needed a couple scores to try and get back into it. And on the final series, Orton uh, was flushed out of the pocket. He he could have ran for a first down. It was fourth down, the last play, their last offensive you know shot of the game. What do you mean he? The, the play calling could have called or, for that? Or, no, no. Or, oh, no yeah. Orton could have. He, he was, you know, flush out. I know you're headed towards the play calling. I know that you're about to say, keep going. But, uh, so he could have ran for a first down, which ultimately, you know, they had already lost at this point. But instead, he went for a long, like, 60-yard bomb to a covered receiver that maybe he could have, you know, got 
pass interference or something like that. But it was he was going to his left and throwing with his right hand, so it was a pretty bad it decision. Yeah, it was it was a bad decision. But my theory is he wanted to end the game because he was just getting beat up so bad by the by the uh, the Dolphins defense, and that made me think of this theory where every quarterback has like a limit to how many times they get hit before they get shell shocked. Mm-hmm. And Orton's, you know, he's an okay quarterback. His he's got like a an okay shell shock. Like maybe he's good for the yeah. first couple quarters, but like after they just keep passing and passing like they they did at the end of the game, you know, he was just he just stopped making throws at some point because yeah. he was throwing too early, trying to anticipate too much. Uh, well, so so I would say different quarterbacks have different like shell shock. Uh, well, I agree. Well, where's Big Ben's? You know, Big Ben's is probably the best in the league. He doesn't even care. You hit he, him and you fall off him. <laughs> like, yeah, he he doesn't he doesn't have a shell shot. Like he's like no, he's like a lineman. Like he doesn't notice if someone hits him and yeah. he gets knocked down. He just gets up again and uh, yeah. I'd say Vic, I would say you know Michael Vick. We're talking about the Jets. He's shell. He's pretty <laughs> fragile back there, and I'm pretty frightened every time he takes off of the ball. Yeah. So he so like the the range would go from who who would be like the lowest shell shock? That would be like Blaine, you know, Blaine I Gabbert. Do, well, I think San- Mark Sanchez is a tough dude, but he's been hit a lot of times in his career. Like, I've seen him get shell-shocked during mm-hmm. Ravens games, a lot of physical defenses, because the Jets have, have had years where they have bad offenses, offensive lines. But I think Sanchez is, uh, you know, he has a pretty... <laughs> he can be shell-shocked. <laughs> pretty, all right. So he, so him or maybe, I don't know, who else would be at the lower end of that? Um, Dalton? Yeah, it seems like Dalton. I think the he games. kind of gets uh, what's the word? Frazzled whenever you know you get pressure on him and he starts to get hit. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, that'd be on the lower end, and then the upper end obviously is Big Ben, who is well, we don't even rank Big Ben because he doesn't care if he gets hit. Yeah, he he, he does. He just doesn't notice it. But, <laughs> but also on the upper end is probably like uh, Aaron Rodgers. Well, Aaron, yeah, he's so used to getting hit. Yeah, and he's still like one of the best players in the league. Yep. Aaron Rodgers, I still think to this day, is the best player in the league right now because he's never had an offensive line, basically. You know, during when they won the Super Bowl in 2000, what was it, 2012 or 11? I think um, it was, I think it was 12. No, it was no, 2010. It was 2010, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, he had a pretty good offensive line then, but even since then... He has no protection back there, and all he does is just dice defenses apart because he gets rid of it so quickly. Mm-hmm. But speaking about, you were talking about the Bills Dolphins game. Me and you and uh, a coworker actually going to the Bills Jets game on Sunday. That's and right. And how pumped are you for that? I'm excited. the The Bills are one and zero in games I've seen in person, so I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming that <laughs> undefeated. I'm, yeah, undefeated. And they're they're coming off two pretty bad losses. One game they should have won, and one game where they just played terribly. Yeah. So, both teams will have a lot of rest. The Jets are coming off the bye. Yep, it'll be interesting. I've been to the Ralph. I've been to Ralph Wilson Stadium once, and it was a really good time. And I saw the Jets blow out the Bills. I think it was three years ago. But you know, the Jets are obviously not great this year. <laughs> you know, I, it would make as a Jets fan, even though they're two and eight, to go see them in person, go into enemy territory and beat a rival who is competing for a playoff position. That would honestly make my season. I would be so happy and but that being said the the walk to the parking lot after would be not great for me cause with my Jets jersey on because those fans are going to be not they're going to be pissed <laughs> yeah and I'm not going to protect you either so just I wouldn't just, expect just you to know protect, that going protect me with your physical frame <laughs> I might I might get the first hit in if it comes to that so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah pray pray for me out there <laughs> I'm not going to say my theory is I'm not going to say anything negative about the Bills but I'll cheer for the Jets. I think that's okay, because it's America. I know Bills fans can be a little over the top. I know somebody I went with had a beer thrown at them last time, and they were Bills fans, so that didn't make much sense to me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I I'm a little a, afraid of what's going to happen. I have a friend who went there with his father for uh, a Dolphins game. They're Dolphins fans. And he said it was the worst experience of his life. <laughs> and he's still in contact with the organization about what went down. Like, <laughs> just sending yeah. emails back and forth about how upset he was. And mostly that he had to hear those things and suffer that abuse uh, next to his father. 
<laughs> no, Bills fans, like, the best way to describe them is that they really don't care. Like, the one time I went, I've seen Bills fans argue with Bills fans and get each other ejected from the game because they're so argumentative. It's like, you guys root for the same team. Can't you just all get along? You know, it's one thing to fight with somebody from a rival team, but you guys are rooting for the same cause, so just chill out. That's just my opinion. It's an emotional group that we've been through a lot through the years. So. <laughs> just taking it out every Sunday Yeah, at their own fans. But I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that happens in every football stadium. I doubt that. So. <laughs> I really doubt that. Well, maybe not in Packers Stadium, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Jets fan got their yeah, own man. Matt, Fireman Ed, kicked off uh, the cheering duties, so... Oh, I thought he maybe. quit voluntarily. Well, he did, but it was because... All right, no, that's a fair point. He did do it. <laughs> he chose to. They didn't make him do it. But um, what else do you want to talk about? College hoops. There was basically college hoops all day today. What's called... What is it called? The NCAA tip-off, where they have games starting at like 11 a.m. It's been great. I've been... I watched some of the Baylor, Baylor South Carolina game. That was pretty good. Then I saw Manhattan play Massachusetts. Oh yeah, I saw overtime of that game. Yeah, that was a really good game. Both teams were pretty good. Nice, um, nice play to uh, to force overtime there. Yeah, although he was the only one who could receive the ball, and they somehow didn't cover him. <laughs> <laughs> like he's, you know, every team when they have point something left, they run the same play of the guy who comes around two screens and runs straight at the basket. I guess the other teams just don't realize that that guy's going to get the ball or. I'm not really sure. He he dunked it. Anyway. <laughs> but, well, the big it's game... It's back, though. It, that's a good thing. It's back. Yeah. The two big games tonight, they got Kansas-Kentucky is at 9, and then Duke plays Michigan State at 7, which I'm pretty pumped for because I'm a big Duke fan, which might surprise you because I'm also a Mets and a Jets and a Pacers fan, but... Anyways... Um, All right, well, give us your case on why Duke is going to make the final four. The final four? four? Yeah. Um... Do you have that <laughs> belt yet? Yeah, they don't have a lot of weaknesses. They have depth at every position. I don't... The one thing holding them back, I think, is youth and inexperience. They're going to be relying on a lot of freshmen, although they have the best recruiting class in the nation, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, you know, youth and inexperience could plague them in the tournament if I'm playing devil's advocate. But if you want to talk about how good they are, you know, preseason All-American Player of the Year, Jalil Okafor, the center... Top one recruit coming out of, I think, Illinois, Chicago. But he's a beast, just a problem in the post. I'm looking forward to seeing him play. They have a 6'6 swingman called Justice Winslow, who is extremely athletic, good defensively, can do everything really. Their point guard, Tyus Jones, who committed to Duke, uh, it was a joint commitment with him and Jaleel Okafor. He's amazing. I, I saw him a little in the first two blowout wins, which they won by like 69 and then won the other one by like 50. He's just really a floor leader, just a general point, really pass first, but he can score if you need it. And he's really good in transition. This whole team is exciting to watch in transition because they can all pull up from three. They're all athletic enough to get to the rim and dunk it. And they, they all seem to have a high basketball IQ. I'm really interested to see how they do tonight against a tough test in Michigan State. Um, but I really like Dukes on paper. They have the depth. I think they have the height with Marshall Plumley, seven footer backing up Okafor. I also think their sophomore Emil Jefferson, who is their starting power forward, he really stepped it up in the tournament last year. Um, I believe he's a junior this year, but I think he's going to have an even bigger year this year. I believe he shot sixty six percent last year, which is pretty amazing, and he averaged eight and eight, which was solid for considering how many minutes he played. So I think Duke is going to be a tough team to beat this year in the nation. So he Jefferson stepped up in the tournament when they got upset? Oh, uh, I meant during the regular <laughs> season. Don't uh, remind me. Okay. He stepped up. For, yeah, I was thinking we had a deep tournament run. Duke usually does. Uh, no, that wasn't the case. He stepped up. The, maybe I was talking about the ACC, ACC uh, tournament. That's what I was going to ask, which tournament you <laughs> Yeah, not the NCAA tournament because they lost in the first round to Mercer. But I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping they don't get bounced out in the first round this year. I don't think they will because last year's team really wasn't that good, honestly, outside of Jabari Park and, and Rodney Hood. Um, Do you think uh, Tyus Jones and Okafor are going to go as like a dual package to some NBA team? Like, Do you think they just like refuse to play without each other on the court? Are they going to like sub out no. at the same time, sub out at the same time? For the NBA? No, I think... <laughs> It was that like sarcasm? They're not yeah, gonna, yeah. They're not gonna join, try to join the same NBA team because obviously they don't have as much control over that. But um, 
yeah, I mean, they wanted to play for Coach K and Duke together, and they're one of the most potent combos in the entire nation. Not even just talking about freshman combos, if you're talking about dynamic duos. They seem to be one of the best point blank in the nation, so that'll be exciting. Um, what else? Syracuse, how do you feel about their prospects this year? Are they going to make a deep tournament run? How are they going to be in the ACC? Uh, my guess is not good. <laughs> they they lost, you know, their the NS- best player. Yeah, I mean, start with C.J. Fair, senior leader, their point guard, Tyler Ennis, their most athletic player, Jeremy Grant. So they're going to have to replace all, all those players with either uh, people stepping up from last year to a bigger role, or uh, they have another freshman point guard. Uh, Tyler Ennis, it, I thought he was... You know, he played well above his years as a freshman last year, so I don't expect another freshman to come in and do as much as he did, yeah. especially at the end of games. So um, I'll, they'll play Cal on Thursday, so that'll be the first actual game after these two sort of, uh, you know... Warm-up games. Warm-up games. <laughs> that count so as regular season. I'll have, I'll have a better opinion after that, but honestly, I, I don't expect them to be nearly as good as they were last year, uh, even though they had a disappointing tournament finish. I thought they were a pretty good team. Yeah. I mean, no, I, they ranked, were a great they team. They were ranked number one for so long. Just because so. they lost in the tournament the second round doesn't mean they were a great team all season. You know, that's how the tournament goes. Yeah. But yeah, I think they're going to stink, and I'm looking forward to it. Because, <laughs> I mean, who's their point guard going to be? They have Trevor Cooney, who is, you know, a shooter. He's going to bring the ball up with Gabinage, if that's how you pronounce his name. Gabinage, yeah. You know, he's he's a small forward, Gabinage. So they have a shooting guard and a small forward primarily, primarily going to be bringing the ball up. Well, well, they had that freshman point guard too. Yeah, but he's not that good, right? Well, I'm not sure yet. He was, he's their highest ranked. Uh, What's his name? Signing. His name is Caleb Joseph. Okay. Unrelated to Chris Joseph, who was previously <laughs> a four-year. former Syracuse player. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I saw him playing. He, I watched the game on Friday for about five minutes, and he had a pretty bad turnover. So. Yeah, but you know, honestly, the first game I saw NS, he didn't do that great either. So we'll we'll see if he can be half decent. If he can get Trevor Cooney open looks, if Benege can shut down the other team's best. The de- I think the gut- defense should be okay. That's what I'm hearing. The zone yeah. should be okay. The zone is the zone, and so far <laughs> the, the zone is the zone. This Chewers words in our been spoken. <laughs> what the only actually this is the most the thing I'm most excited about is Rakeem. Christmas is a senior this year, and he was a beast in the first two games. I mean, granted, he wasn't going against anyone like anywhere close to his physical presence. But, yeah, uh, he's six eight and uh, no six nine, and well, they're I, gonna need him. Yeah, but they were actually running plays for him, which you yeah. know, it's very rare for Syracuse teams to run plays for uh, a big man. A big man. To, to, yeah, yeah. The last person who did that was I think um, Rick Jackson, and that was a couple years ago. Yeah, so. well, it's it rare it, these days. It, it's rare that you have a back to the basket player in college basketball. That's like a true post player that has you know their skills really polished. That's what that's what's going to make Jalil Okafor so special from Duke because he's already so polished in the post and he's already NBA ready. And Jabari Parker had a little bit of that last year, even though he's undersized. He had a really good. He could. He was a good back to the basket player, honestly. Yeah, they were in place for him. Yeah, but um, very much so. Um, do you want to get to? Possibly your favorite NBA player that's currently not injured. <laughs> yeah, sure, Lance Stevenson. Yeah, you sent me you sent me a text just saying Lance Stevenson, and then what <laughs> what he did. Do you want to describe what he did to everyone who didn't see it? Um, well, apparently, I forget who they were playing, but it happened on Saturday night. Lance, oh, they were playing the Warriors. Lance Stevenson flopped, and he dry. You know how he's so famous for flopping on the court and all his on court antics. Last year, he blew in the ear of LeBron James. He also did. He was listening in on Miami's huddle. He's just kind of a goofball on the court. <laughs> you know, he's he's young and immature, but I still like the guy because he, he's really competitive and he just tries to do anything at all. His, basically, mentality, like, if you were to ask him about his antics, he'd be like, I just try to do whatever I can to help my team win. <laughs> and like, he, like, he literally thinks he's trying to help his team win by doing this stuff, which is obviously debatable, but... 
Well, I, I Flop, think he's funny. Flop isn't describing exactly what happened. Good okay, enough, so cause... he slapped himself in the face. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want to get to. Literally, like, Harrison Barnes was, like, setting a screen on him. Lance slaps himself in the face, and the ref calls a foul on Harrison Barnes. And it worked. Lance got granted the foul call, and it, it just blew up on Twitter for obvious reasons, because it's just Lance being Lance. <laughs> that should just be a hashtag in itself. But, um, yeah, so... I mean, you can't argue... And when does it stop with this guy? I mean, he's just... I, do you think he's going to get fined? I mean, I feel like he should get fined for something like that. I mean, they, the NBA doesn't want people to start doing this, but honestly, who else would do this? <laughs> like, I can't think about it. Well, JaVale McGee is, is a name, maybe. Yeah. I mean, that dude has been, <laughs> tried That's to shoot at his own basket it. before, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was... I do miss him on the court for his talent and everything that he brought to the Pacers, as well as his... Uh, comedy routines. <laughs> the funny thing is, as he's never really been reprimanded for off the court issues in his in his short NBA career. It's just mostly on the court stuff. He's, so I give him credit for that at least. You know, it's not yeah. like he's getting into you know drugs or beating people in elevators or things like that. Right. Yeah. He, he seems to be just uh, maybe a gamer on the court where he just you know <laughs> tries to get any advantage he can. And he did have a nice uh, game winning three pointer the other night too. Yeah. Well. That was a bank shot, wasn't it? The, no, which one are you talking about? He had a game winner earlier in the year that was a bank. No, it wasn't a bank. It was, oh. it was just, just a 3 Jeez, so he had another one? Yeah. He can be... Well, he's not afraid to take the big shot, that's no, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> he's fearless. He expects that he's going to be on game. I mean, ball. like he talked trash to LeBron all last playoff series, who's the best player on the planet. So right. Obviously, he has no fear. <laughs> and it worked against him completely. Right. LeBron, just, <laughs> LeBron just went off. <laughs> but he clearly didn't learn his lesson. Um, all right. But yeah. Well... That's uh, that's all we got to talk about this week. Um, Next week we can talk about Shen football, how they did this past weekend in the state semifinals. We can also talk about maybe we'll get into start all star, yeah, all stars, or maybe even uh, some basketball talk for high school basketball. Uh, yeah, that season's be... right around the corner. The games are starting uh, after Thanksgiving, so yeah, that would be fun too. Well, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. Talk to you later. Crowns are thinning out. Into the light down in the subway stations Here this train speeds underground This train speeds under the river But now we'll drift back to the slope Someplace on the distant Judean climb Where I will sleep off all the